What's going on, Hustler University? This is something that's a little different. It's going to be very, very different. If you watch the video, and if you haven't watched the video, I highly encourage you to watch the video that's before this. Make sure you watch it. It is around 25 minutes, but it's well worth watching because the things that he is saying in this video is very recent is something that I discovered intimately a long time ago. And I will share with you how my last job was one of the best things ever happened to me. My last two jobs, my last two jobs. I learned something about ownership because I was exposed for the second time, but in a different capacity to rich people. For the sake of this conversation, we're going to define rich people as folks who do not have to work for their money. Their money works for them. So that can be someone worth 1.5 million, 2.5 million because they have the power to allow their money to work for them. Now, there's many groups of rich people in the term of rich people. When, when you say rich, most people are talking about the ultra mega wealthy. What I have learned is that when people get to that position based upon personality, upbringing, two things happen. They remain a sane, sensible person or they become Caligula. I will give you a recent example of that. With reselleology, I met someone when I was getting my car serviced. And she is a rich person. Her and her husband own real estate and they make a great deal of money. I was going to go around my neighborhood because there's some, I mean, it's just literally stuff I see on the corner that could make money. And I figured, hmm, if that's on the corner, what's in these houses that they don't need? So that was the premise for starting reselleology. And I met this lady and she behaved as a rich person. We were at her compound because she had the type of house where there's a call box and then you go about half a mile up a driveway. I was supposed to sell some stuff for her, motorcycles, some other stuff. She had some other service people because understand that was my capacity to this person. I was a service person. When they saw that she was selling the motorcycles, they all came over. They were looking. One guy just offered her some money right off the cuff. I knew at that point that I was no longer going to be able to sell those. She was nice. She never said it. She and her husband went on a two-week vacation to Europe. I never heard from her again. After recently, she sent me a text. It's like the hardest thing that she had to sell, she still had that. And she's like, are you still interested in selling this stuff? Knowing that all of the juicy stuff that was part of the original deal, it's already gone because she sold it herself. And... I sent her a picture, because uh, for most of you that don't know, uh, there's a new addition to the Cameron family. I sent a picture of my daughter to her, and I didn't get a response. That is the callous nature that he's talking about in the video that happens with a lot of rich people. They become desensitized and totally, totally self-absorbed that's one of the reasons that you've heard me say it. it's like I, I'm, I have no intention of trying to become a billionaire there are ways to become a billionaire and not sell your soul but the avenues are few and far between because typically when you get to that level if you're not taking people out they're trying to take you out but you can get to 10 20 30 40 50 60 million which is enough money to fund several generations of a family quite well. And you can get to that level and not lose yourself. But when you start really raking it up there, getting up there, unless you just invent some wonderful product, there, like I said, there are ways that you can become a billionaire and not lose your soul. But there's not a lot of them. Because that's what happens. And my last job I was dealing, and this, this is one of the things that cracks me up because I picked up on this in high school. You will have people from the rich class, any subset, that will tell you, all you have to do is work hard. Go to school and become successful. If you see my video, the degree myth, 
And the other ones, that's like how the recession exposed that lie. It worked for a long time, but it never really worked. It was part of a system that served a handful of people. Because I want you to think about this. You have Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Dell, Henry Ford, Vanderbilt, the old Vanderbilt. You have a lot of people that became extremely wealthy and did not go to school. Think about that. This is the power construct. Get the money, get the power, then get the education. This is how most people do it. They get the education, they try to get the money, and they try to get the power. And it doesn't work most of the time. You get the money first by creating your own economy, then you get the power, then you get the education. Because the education is to groom those two other things that you already have. Most people are trying to become educated to groom nothing that they have, which is why it's really falling flat on his face right now. And a lot of people are scratching their heads. I got referred to this job from a friend. I went in and there's two partners. One partner, he was he was the average American at that point. He's no longer the average American. He is now rich. And the senior partner, the one that had the control and interest of the company, was from the rich class. His father started that company, which was selling different things, 30 years prior. For those that don't know, he inherited a 30-year-old corporation with a paydex, tax forms, credit, and bank accounts. If you know anything about corporations, a 30-year-old corporation like that is extremely powerful. You can buy a house with a corporation like that. Most young corporations cannot do that because they don't have the credit profile or the history. A 30-year-old company that's been making millions of dollars, that corporation is extremely powerful in terms of family planning in terms of being a holding company, in terms of hiding money, there's so many things you can do with that asset that his father created for him. Now, the one from the rich crowd who didn't know me because I knew the other guy from uh, being a referral and actually did some business with him. It was... An interesting conversation because the one from the rich class was telling me, well, you know, I believe in working hard and, you know, working, you know, my father, when I worked in the business, you know, he made me do all this stuff. And and my mind was like, but he had a business to bring you up in. Now, give you some background. This guy has four kids and he never came to the business because he used the guy who was the former working class guy to do all of the grunt work. When we were working, sometimes I wouldn't see him for weeks because he never came to the office. But this was his power. Since he was of the rich class, all of his friends were of the rich class. So he was able to get deals that no one else could get because he lived in the neighborhood of the CEOs, the decision makers. They were his friends and neighbors. So if he couldn't get to someone, he invariably, you know, if you understand the six degrees of separation, he can go through his influential decision-making, rich, controlling group friends to get to people that no ordinary person could get to. That was his power. And that was a lot of value. That's why the other guy from the working class came on. He saw he knew the value. He's and now he is now part of the rich class and his kids will be like the rich guy because they're growing up in that environment. So I'm sitting there and listening to this and it's like, you didn't do any of this stuff to get where you are. You were born in the position that 99.8% of Americans will never, ever attain. I left that pause in there for you to think about it. Because once I realized what was really going on, what was really going down. In 1998, I completely changed my mindset. I am a capitalist, but I am not a mercenary capitalist, 
which means I will lay siege to anyone or anything that gets in the way of my profits. I'm not that type of capitalist. Many capitalists are mercenary capitalists. If it gets in the way of profit, it has to be killed. It has to be destroyed. It has to be obliterated. I'm not that kind of guy. That's one of the reasons. And like, I made a contract with myself and I know how far I will go. And I can go very far without losing my soul and my humanity, which is very, very important to me. Many people don't aren't that introspective because I live in the neighborhood with these people now. And this is the first time that I've lived around that many. I've always lived in, you know, well-to-do or okay neighborhoods, but I live around, I mean, just to give you an example, Arthur Blank lives maybe 10 miles away. I live in that kind of neighborhood. And just casual interactions in public and restaurants and the conversations, it's a totally different mindset that has nothing to do with money. Because when I watched the video with Chris, I was just shaking my head. I was like, yep, yep, <laughs> yep. That's how they think. And it's about extortion. When they came up with the 99 percenters and they were, you know, the uh, the sit in on Wall Street. And I did the video saying how stupid it was. It wasn't because they didn't have some serious issues to be discussed. They were using the wrong tool to try to deal with the situation because that is not going to work with this group of people. It's just not going to work. It, 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 you, power is never giving up. It is lost or taken. It is never given up. And when I say lost, you go to the Roman civilization, they lost power because they became fat and lazy. That's how they lost it. They didn't really give it away. They just didn't care enough to maintain it. They were trying to take power from people who are hell-bent on maintaining power and have created an infrastructure that facilitates the maintenance of that power. Essentially, it gathered press. It got people talking. But shit not only didn't change, it got worse. <laughs> That's one of the reasons that I don't watch Talking Heads. That's why I don't subscribe to political parties and listen to the indoctrination talk. Look up K O C H K O C. Yeah, I think it's K O C H, the Koch brothers. Those two men who were billionaires self funded the Tea Party. They are, you know, Tea Party members are actually marionettes. They're puppets and they don't even know it. They think that these are their original thoughts. Because if you ever have a problem with someone politically that is sensible, if they're not sensible, you can't have this conversation. You just hit them with 10 logical responses and watch their face screw up because they're not ready for that. They're ready for an angry, over-the-top, populist, centered, some type of emotional, reactionary view that's not based in logic. Because a lot of these people, they're pawns. And when you really understand how the game is played, you wouldn't really be mad at these people. They have been used, and that's what I talk about in psychology and systems. Give you another example. In the 1920s and 1930s, in the United States of America, all white people were not created equal. If you were from Poland or you were from Ireland, you were in the same class as black people. Not wanted, not trusted, and abused. Don't believe me? Look it up. So, understand, it wasn't just black people. There were many immigrant white people who went through the same stuff. That's why you have certain neighborhoods up north in New York, Massachusetts, that were uh, uh, settled by these immigrants. And to this day, they have a heavy immigrant flavor to them. That's why you have firefighters that all come from this Irish these clans, because those were the only jobs they could get. The dirty, dangerous, that was the only jobs they could get. And then they turned it into a source of cultural pride and a family tradition. Do you understand how deep that is? And as time went on, people do not tell the stories 
the grandparents of the grandparents of the grand. These stories are lost. People don't talk about it. And in the absence of truth, the imagination reigns supreme. People start to come up with romanticized notions of what was. But when you do the research, there were people marching, no more immigrants. Get those spicks back to Italy. Send those Polacks back to Poland. There was a anti, a heavy, heavy anti-immigrant sentiment. But because those in power needed cheap, uneducated, and easy to control labor, it was like, come on in. Because understand, if the ruling elite at the time didn't want those people to come here, they wouldn't have came. Understand that. They would have not come to America. The doors would have not been open. There were there were needed a lot of people to run those factories to create these things. This is the system. Now back to my last job. I stayed there, and it's kind of like with the yes, I'm still with the black guy type experience. I knew from day one what I was dealing with, which really put me in a very powerful position. I was under no romantic sized notion of where I was. I was dealing with a rich person that was used to getting his way, commanding people around, and extorting people for personal gain. I sat back and I studied him. Little things that popped up. One day we had a manufacturer's rep come by and it was really interesting. We all went to lunch and the rich person at the time had The very rare BMW. Now, I know one morning I went to work and he was there for a short period of time. I walked by his car and I saw a Wachovia receipt on the dashboard. It was the first time that I've ever seen an ATM receipt with seven figures on it. I've never seen that in my life before nor since. He had pulled out 500 bucks cash and it was seven figures figures on the ATM receipt. It's just sitting there. Because in his neighborhood, that's a common occurrence. There's no reason to hide it. There's no reason to think that someone's going to, you know, in his world, it's very safe. So we go, and the other guy who was from the working class, we're all heading toward the BMW XUV because it's big, and then he didn't want me to ride in it. I'm telling you this. So we all ended up in the manufacturer's car. So many things. And going back to my draw, I tried to negotiate for a better draw, but because I was bringing some context to the table and I actually had a few deals cooking that I could transfer over. Once again, rich person, maximum exploitation. I had a thousand dollar draw. I took it because I had some money in the bank. And I had the hustler mindset was in full effect. Instead of going in there and lobbying and campaigning to get more money, I took the job. Thank you very much. Got my thousand dollars or my commission, whatever came first. And I spent probably 20 hours a week working on their business. And I spent the other 60 hours I was working, working on mine. I used their resources. I used their connections. That is actually how I ended up getting my first access to the Imperial Mart. Because I knew, because I did my research, that's how I know who the corporation was, and I knew they had an account at the Imperial Mart. I had a business card with that account name on it. And this is how it works when you go into the Imperial Mart. If you got a business card and you work for the company and you show ID, you can get in. And I went down there. And I was like, yes, uh, I'm a buyer for Blanky Blank Company. And I showed the lady my business card. And she's oh yes, wow, you've been, wow, y'all have been here a long time. Business must be good. I was like, yep, over 30 years. She said, that's remarkable. Well, congratulations for joining such a fine firm. Here's your access. So this is what I'm talking about, not being emotional and running away from your problems or when you're dealing with some stuff because before I developed the hustler mindset at that point I would have got up and walked and said fuck them a thousand dollars a month I can do better no 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 I was like this is a rich guy this guy has connections this guy has access 
he doesn't like me, which I picked up on instantly. Other guy, we got along just great. We're actually still friends. But he didn't like me, but I learned so much from him. I learned about the expectations. I learned about his world. I got access. I didn't get just a, a, you know, standing outside the window with my nose pressed, pressed to the glass. I was sitting at the table. Understand, I was still a servant, and it's very important for you to know where you are. I had no extended notions of who or what I was. Was got to the house, I sat at his table, I ate his, ate his food, and I made a connection with one of his neighbors that helped me with future deals. Because that's what I'm talking about. Don't hate the player. Don't hate the game. Learn the fucking rules so you can win. Because when you understand, and that's why I really want you to watch that video with Chris, many people do not know that that, that is their predicament. They think that they can work extremely hard and make it. And the fact is, unless you are working in certain fields, or you wake up and realize you need to have your own business, that's not going to be the case. And the reason I'm bringing this to you is the American standard of living has peaked. It's actually going to go down for most people. And the reason is, even with our, our poor people, because understand, a great, more than about, I'm going to say about 80% of the world's population lives in damn near abject poverty. That's why when people come to America and they say the streets align with gold, it's because of their perspective. So even as we decline, our standard of living is still going to be better than most of the people on this planet. But people don't know that, and they just live in their own skulls. So understand, that is, this is the thing that's going on. This is the reason that Walmart, as much as people hate them, is going to continue to be successful. Because they know this game. And they know how to play it. And those, those stores and all of that money's generated, the majority of it goes to a room full of people. Big room, probably like maybe a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred. The majority of the money that Walmart makes goes to about fifteen hundred people. Out of all the people that shop there and work there, only about fifteen hundred people are really getting sizable chunks of that money. And that's how the system is set up. Now, with Chris's video, like I said, I believe in 90% of that stuff because I've seen it. I've met people like that. I know how they operate. But this is the thing. And that's why I put up in a recent email that I sent out, the Internet doesn't level the playing field. The Internet is a completely and utterly different playing field. And that is the reason... The Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs, the Zuckerbergs, the Angry Bird guys, the Zanga guys. That is the reason that these guys were able to come from okay to better than average or meager upbringing and become billionaires. Because it's a new playing field that the old established rich got caught sleeping on. Because if they knew or really were on this thing early, a lot of these internet fortunes that you see we're building, because understand, a lot, of these, a lot of people still don't understand the internet. They still don't understand computers. That's why they make computers super, super simple. The less people who understand how the internet works or the architecture of the internet or the implements of the internet, the greater the control. See, the internet was like this 5,000 pound genie that got out the bottle. And it was like, oh, shit. They're talking to each other. They're communicating with each other. They're building digital communi communities. They're exchanging resources. They're exchanging money. They're doing transactions. And we cannot regulate it. Do you think it's an accident? I will tell you, for the most of my time on eBay, I ain't, you, couldn't, you couldn't track our money. Because they wasn't reporting it to the government. PayPal just recently started reporting it to the government. What you think about that? And a lot of online merchant accounts just recently started reporting it because you couldn't track it. 
you can make an incredible amount of money and nobody knew what you were doing. So all of this change, all of these new policies and rules and taxations are designed not so much for fair distribution of, you know, people paying their tax. No, no, no. This is about control. This is about power because once you track people, once people start paying taxes, then it's like, wow, this person made $10 million. Hmm, what are they doing? How are they doing it? And two, and that's another reason that Bitcoin, and if Bitcoin doesn't make it, there will be another digital currency. You can bet your last dollar on that. It's coming because with the internet, this new playing field that grew up, there are dark corners of the internet that unless you know where to look, you can't find it. There are people that have communities that do stuff online that you don't have the IP. You, you can't find it. It's like these are like hidden communities. It's like hiding in broad, it's like hiding in broad daylight. To give you an idea of this, start going to some foreign websites and you will be amazed. Like go to the, the easiest way to do this is go to Amazon UK, Amazon Japan, and just start seeing all this stuff that you've never heard of or never saw that's being blocked. That's not part of the organic search results. Trust me, there, there's some stuff out there that's just like freaking awesome. So this is was my real lesson, my first first lesson in pimping by a rich person. That's the reason I speak to you like that I do on my YouTube videos. It is my purpose to piss you off, make you get off your ass, and start taking control of your life. Because I don't think that they can ever control the internet. Because China has tried. Now, let's really talk about the totalitarian state. That's China. China makes no bones about it. It's like, I am the pimp and all of you are my bitches. And the internet... They can't control it. They control most of it and they shut it down, but people are still figuring out how to communicate and get out. And this is with a government that's hell bent on stopping that access and they still can't stop it. Come here to the other parts of the world where they just kind of like, oh shit, this internet thing kind of just got out. Of they, they, they haven't started that. I mean, there, there's, there's policies. There's things that are going into place. That is one of the reasons about domain names. Why you got to have a domain name? Why you have to register? There's a reason because it can you can be tracked and you can be watched and can be monitored. But the cool thing is you can do so much that can't be stopped now. It's ridiculous. Now, one of the reasons that I have my own site is at the moment YouTube is wide open. But they're starting to clamp down. They're clamping down on hate speech. Translation, they're, they're clamping down on dissidents. Um, certain channels have disappeared, but they were just all, everything's wrong, fuck the world. They're getting rid of those. Or they're playing around with their viewership. <laughs> so even to that degree is control. That's why, you know, Facebook is still wide open. YouTube is still open. Instagram, Twitter, it's still wide open. And the thing is, it's going to be extremely hard for them to lock that shit down because it's gotten out. And that is your power. Because when you understand, the internet is not, you know, it doesn't level the playing field. It is a new playing field with a new set of rules, with a new game plan, a new uniform and different teams. Because the old school economy, the disruptive economy, and the internet economy all exist at the same time on different tiers. Right now, the old school economy is still greater than the internet economy. The old school economy is 100 times bigger than the internet economy. That's going to change. So, by employing certain things, gaining certain knowledge, you know, starting to think about your life in a different manner, it's going to put you in a position to take advantage of that growth. 
Right now, you have people doing GoFundMe, Kickstarter. These folks are making incredible amounts of money because of the power of social media, that connection. So understand, in the new economy, the new disruptive economy in the Internet, you don't have to pimp people to become successful and wealthy. Because so you can become successful without being wealthy. And you can be wealthy and not be successful, just depending upon your proclivities and what you deem important in your life. But this this is what I'm talking about. These are great times. These is why I'm this is why I'm freaking excited. And I want you to be excited because by using the internet and whatever special skill sets, special abilities that you have, you can win because it's a new playing field and it's still give you an example I don't know how many people giggled when I said in 2009 I was going to put videos up on YouTube people didn't understand it people still don't understand it it's about distribution and reach there is no way employing old school methodology that I could have reached as many people on YouTube without spending at this point probably I'm going to say 500,000. Probably spent at this juncture, yeah, about 500,000 or more to reach the same number of people. And the, the problem with that, when you used paid search or paid marketing, the stickiness and the conversion rate is not as high as socially proofed marketing which is what a youtube video is and social proof is you watch a video and you're like wow that's really crazy then you put it on your facebook page and then your buddy bob puts it on his facebook page every time that video is shared that is more and more social proof that hey one person liked it enough to share that's social proof you don't get that with paid marketing when was the last time that someone put a flyer on your car or some type of promotion that was thrust in your face that you took it and shared it with someone else. I'm going to say probably never or rarely with most of you going never, but how many times have you shared a YouTube video, an Instagram picture, something witty, some wise words from someone's Facebook page. Every day you do that stuff every day. That is the power of the new economy. So I want you to think about it and understand Going forward, you don't have to pimp anybody. You don't have to lie to anybody. And you don't have to exploit anyone to have the life that you want. Those are old economy notions and stuff that's pushed down from the rich class. And there is class warfare. There is definitely class warfare. People's like, there is no class warfare. When you are poor and someone drives in your neighborhood with this extremely outrageous, it's like, like a Bentley, extremely expensive car, there's a group of people that's like, fuck that motherfucker. Could be the nicest person in the world driving that car just because they have something that the have-nots don't have. It creates resentment. And there are many people think there's going to be a revolution. I actually am not one of those people. I don't think there will be a revolution because... All of the things that both political parties have done to all of us in terms of legislation, policy making that have fucked all of us. If that wasn't enough to get enough people off their ass to create a revolution, it ain't happening. Because luxuries once tasted become necessities. People are used to whatever they have. It's better to dance with the devil you know than the angel you never met. There, there's no revolt coming. There's no revolution coming. It's not coming. Because if it was, it would have happened a long time ago. A long time ago. Roughly about, you know, six months when uh, JF Kennedy put the country back on the silver standard and took the power away from the Fed. And when he got shot and some other stuff that happened, if that was going to be a revolution, that was the time. Understand, we, we don't have it. Look at that thing that uh, Occupy Wall Street. It happened. It went away. 
compare and contrast that to the civil rights movement, which went on from the 1930s till today. <laughs> Did you get what I just said? It ain't stopped. It's not as big, but it's still going, going. The 99 percenters, because of the entitlement and the way a lot of them grew up, they don't have uh, tenacity. They don't have terminate. They don't have stamina. That's why they just kind of like let it go. It's like it ain't working. They're arresting us. If they were really staunchly rooted in their beliefs, they'd still be there right now. Right now, today. So, these are the Hustle University perspectives because this is going to be where your real education begins because so many people want the system and I will give you systems and I will give you formulas to help you but it is very very important that you understand what's happening what's going on with the world because I make a lot of my business decisions based on things that I read from world events give you case in point you know it was storage auction guru I was doing all that stuff and then I realized that we're going to have this huge population base i.e. a market of people who are going to have to develop business skills. Understand, not want to develop business skills. They're going to have to do it because of what's happening with the economy. I've said it so many times. There are some of you who are listening to this right now. You have a job. It's going well. You got money in the bank. You're you're matching your 401k. You're getting your match. You're doing all the stuff. You don't even have credit card debt. Your car's paid off. You're living the La Vida Loca. Then five years from now, someone's going to say, oh, excuse me, Carl, excuse me, Shelly, could you meet us in the conference room? And they're going to have you a pink slip and give you a severance package because your job has been disrupted. And you didn't do anything wrong. You showed up on work every day. You did your damnness. You worked hard. You did your part. And then technology said, I'm going to bitch slap you out of a job. That's the thing that's messing with people. They don't understand. Corporations are striving to be as efficient as possible without raising cost. Nothing is more efficient than a piece of software or some automation process that may cost $50,000 to $200,000 that will get rid of 100 jobs. Because those jobs are paying $20,000 a piece plus, say, workers' comp. You know, those jobs effectively are costing the company you know, you may get paid twenty thousand or thirty thousand, but you're costing the company twenty eight to forty grand to have you. Those costs go away, and the productivity goes up. Who wouldn't want a piece of that action? Who wouldn't? That's what's happening, and it's going to accelerate. I mean, my big worry is we have a large group of people that, and when I say this, it's not me being indelicate. It's just facts. We have a large group of people we just don't need. They are not contributing to the economy. They are taking away from the economy. When I say don't need, I'm not talking about line up people and shoot them or put them in camps. But, you know, in our lifetimes, some shit like that could possibly happen. And this will happen to the people who don't understand what's going on. And when I say camps, because there's already camps. If you ever notice there's certain neighborhoods that are occupied by a certain culture of people, that's a camp. You think, oh, we went there, we established this, we built this ourselves. No, you were redlined into that shit. I would say the Asians here in up in Pleasant Hill area, I would say that they did that because they came in with money and a plan. They came in and put up banks first, created loan situations, and then they did the other thing. So I would say, yeah, they did that. But if it's a poor borough hood type neighborhood, no, you were redlined into that shit. And then if the neighborhood has desirable architecture and enough people say, hey, we want to live there. Guess what? You're going to be gentrification is going to move your ass out. So you got a choice. Pay attention to what's going on and govern yourself accordingly. Because you can win. But you're not going to win playing the old school game on the new economy field. It's not going to work. All right. This is Glendon and I will see you on the good side.